I had an opportunity recently to read through a, an article that reminded, it was one of those articles that was sort of like a picture book. It had as many pictures in it as it did words. I love those books, don't you? Doesn't take long to read through those. But anyway, uh, this, this article had four distinct pictures in it. The first picture was this. It was a picture looking out on, off a front porch of a, of a beautiful farmhouse out in, I believe it was Kansas. And you looked out upon acres and acres and acres of wheat out, full-grown wheat out in the, uh, off, the far, off the porch. And on the, on the porch, there was a mother and her little toddler boy. And obviously, you could see the relationship between the two. And so there was just this, this bu- picture of beauty and as you saw the relationship of the mother and, and her child, as well as the fields that were white and to harvest, right? The next picture sh- showed that there was an opportunity in the process that there was a frantic moment in mom and dad's life. The child was missing, and they showed the picture of them sort of frantically running through the fields, the wheat fields that were out in front of them, acres and acres and acres of wheat fields. And they found themselves in a situation where that they were looking for the child that had wandered away. It was a toddler. Obviously, the wheat was much taller than the child, and so the child had wandered out into the wheat fields. And they were frantically calling and trying to find every way that they could, and they did that until dark. The next picture showed a, uh, a, the townspeople because that, then the afternoon they had get, gone into town, gathered the townspeople together and began to put together a group of people and they agreed the next morning that they would get up early and go and look for the little child that obviously had wandered off into the fields. And, and the picture that was the townspeople was literally that they all linked hands and sort of walked this entire wheat field as they, were, as they were walking across hand in hand as a group of people to do the, what, was, what they were doing, called to do is to look for this little child. And the fourth picture was the picture of the mother holding her little toddler boy who had succumbed to the elements that evening and died in the wheat field. You know, the tragedy of that story is is that had there been an opportunity beforehand to have gathered the group of people together to have walked the fields of that wheat, that they could have found that little boy before it was too late. I wonder today, when I think about that story and I think about what God has called you and I to do as the church, we have one purpose, given us one task, And that one task is for us to make disciples. That's it. We've been called to invest our time and our energy and our resources to do that one thing, to make disciples. But what I recognize is in my own life, I can't speak about you guys are probably a lot more focused than than I am. There are times in life that something sidetracks my focus and I get off focus from time to time. And I think it's important as we think about passages like this that they become for us a reminder of the task that God has set before us to be makers of disciples. We know the context of the story we've been reading through there. Matter of fact, this week will be our last week in Matthew chapter 5. Next week, we'll wrap up our series on the Beatitudes and then ultimately lived out for the world to see. But I'm going to be in John 13, and I would invite you to take your Bibles, not today, but sometime this week, read through John 13 a few times, and just just ask God to speak to you ahead of time as we get to that place, because I really believe that's where we want to land in this series, because we've been talking about what God does in us so that he can do through us what he desires to do. You know, there's been so many times in my life that I've prayed this little simple prayer. Sometimes it's a little scary scary prayer to pray, but I've oftentimes prayed this prayer, Lord, do to me what you must do in order to do through me what you desire to do. Because I'm convinced today that God wants to use every one of us to further his kingdom. 
The problem is, is we oftentimes get sidetracked or whatever happens, life happens, you know, it all happens for all of us. And we get to the place sometimes that we lose track of that which God has called us to do. But the Beatitudes really is talking about God working in us, the the Beatitudes, so that we might become salt to the world, that we might bring about a sense of flavor to the world. And I, we find ourselves in the process of it, we leave a taste in someone's mouth. You know, you think about that, don't you? I took a mint just a few moments ago before I, before I got up here, and I've still got the taste of the mint in my mouth. I know some of you are saying, well, why didn't you share one with me? I understand. I'm, I'm not trying to be selfish today, but it leaves a taste, right? And the reality is when we connect with people sometimes, they leave a taste in our mouth, Right? What kind of taste are we leaving in the mouths of the people that we engage with? Being a salt of the earth, God has called us to be such a flavorful aspect in the, in, in the mouths and the lives of others. Is it going to be bland? Is it going to be uh, destructive? Or is it going to be pleasant, flavorful? And the reality is God's called us to be salt to world that we might be able to flavor the world, as God is transforming our lives on the inside, we begin then to influence the world on the outside, and we do so first by being salt. Last week, we talked about the aspect of why we we need salt and light. In your notes this morning, I draw your attention back to that passage, back to that place, because I believe as we shared last week, I want to remind us, why in the world did God call us to be salt and light to begin with? First of all, because of the corruption that is present within humanity. Our world is not in a good spot. I, I've, I've thought this past week, we had the opportunity, I, I, I rarely promote movies, and I'm not promoting a political party when I say this, but I, we had the privilege last night to go see the movie Reagan. It was a great historical record of the events that took place behind the scenes there. What a, what, just, it, it was great. But as I left that place last night, I thought, how much further down the road of corruption has our world traveled since the 1980s? We have, whoo. I really believe, now I'm not, I'm not being prophetic when I say this, I don't, but I really believe that the reason why we're seeing such a rapid digression of of morality and everything else in our world is because I really think that we're in the last days and Christ is coming back soon. And when he comes back, here's my heart. And I want to somehow this morning, my goal today is to help you to to hopefully gain this kind of heart. I want to be able to meet Jesus and look him square in the eyes and honestly say to him, I have furthered your kingdom. Now, I, I, we want, everybody wants to hear him say, well done, good, good and faithful servant. We do. But can we honestly say with the lives that we've lived, I've devoted my life to further your kingdom kingdom. I want to be able to say that because that's what God has called us to do, right? He's called us to make disciples, but we see the corruption in our world or in our, around humanity, but we also understand that God has called us to be lights because of the darkness that is also prevalent in our world. If you've seen the news media, some some school system in Florida has recently taken a stand to, to be able to invite pastors to come in and be counselors in the, in the state of Florida. It's a great opportunity. One of the first groups of people that raised their hand and said, we want our pastor to come, was the Church of Satan. And you're sitting there going, is there actually such a thing? And the answer is Yes. The reason why it is is because our world is growing increasingly dark. The darkness of evil is continually rising up among us. And we're living in a world that's increasingly dark and it's increasingly corrupt. And the reason why we're living in a world that's that way is because 
This world is filled with sinners. <laughs> and you and I are one of those, right? We've all sinned and we've all fallen short. We all mess up. We all blow it. How many of y'all sinned this week? The rest of you just did. <laughs> Lying still a sin. Anyway. I love you anyway. anyway. I'm grateful God loves us, right? Amen? Amen. As we look at this passage this morning, I'd like for us to consider, pick up, if you would, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. I'll read the context. Remember the Beatitudes that was established prior to that God working to transform our lives from the inside so that, verse 13, we, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall, it be, how, it's, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer for good, good for anything except to be thrown down and trampled under people's feet to become the roadbed that we would walk upon. Verse 14, and he's called you and I to be the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does people light a lamp and put it underneath a basket. This little light of mine, I'm going to, what? Let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan it out, right? I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. We don't light our lamps and put it underneath a bushel. We don't put a bucket over top of it. But rather, he's called us to be able to give light to the entire house. Verse, verse 18 goes on to say, 16 goes on to say, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let me mention three or four things, if I can, sort of by summary of what, what we need to clarify the source of light. Number one is... As a follower of Christ, you and I are a vehicle through which light is cast. This morning, I've got a flashlight. It's a handy little flashlight. It's a neat place. Matter of fact, if you know anything about uh, these flashlights, they are not only good for flat light, they're also good for, you can use them for weapon, right? Sometimes you may need to do that. You know, y'all used to do that maybe in the police department. Had these big old long five-cell flashlights you had to drag around like this. But boy, when you swung it, you had some weight to it, right? The reality is this light without batteries I don't care how many times you flick it, there's not going to be any light that emits from it. Why? Because it's disconnected from the power source. You and I are the flashlight the vehicle through which the light of God is cast out into the world. Our purpose is not to glorify ourself, to bring attention to ourself, but rather we're to bring light to the world. I've also got a smaller flashlight here today that actually has its batteries in it, and when you click the light, it has all kinds of opportunities to emit some light across. Why is the difference? But what's the difference between this flashlight? Obviously, it's smaller. I got that. But the reason why this one works and this one doesn't is because this one is connected to its power source. You and I are the vehicle through which light is cast to a dark and dying world. Letter B in your notes. The source of light comes from the connection we have with Christ. Jesus said it this way. John chapter 8, verse 12, one of the, one of the most life-transforming verses in my life. I look, I look back, and there's some verses that really God used to shape my life, and this was one of those. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will walk no longer in darkness, but will have the light of life within him. God provides for us an opportunity to be connected with the light of the world. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. We're not, but we are lights to the world because we're connected with the Savior, and therefore we emit His light to a world around us. Thirdly, our connection with Christ then becomes the light, 
letter C in your notes, becomes the light that the world will see. I've, I've included in your notes this morning a, 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 a short paragraph from Charles Spurgeon. I don't oftentimes include that. I, I, I don't want to highlight what men have to say. I'd rather highlight what God has to say. But I think he, he hits the nail on the head today. And I think it would be helpful for us to be able to at least be reminded what he has said. Charles Spurgeon said this way, The Bible is not the light of the world. We oftentimes want to make it that way. Westboro Baptist Church is one of those churches in America that doesn't necessarily bring benefit to what God's called the church to be. If y'all know anything about Westboro Baptist Church, they're oftentimes going and protesting about wherever it is, and they'll take and put their scripture up and tell, tell people that God hates certain, certain groups of people and uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of mess like that. And the reality is they seek to try to take God's word and cram it down the world's throat, but the Bible was never intended to be the light to the world. The Bible was intended to be the light to the church. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His word was intended to be a light to us. But God has called us through the transforming power of the word of God within us to not, to not force the world to read the Bible. That's not the, the world doesn't read the Bible, but it does read you and I. Therefore, God's called us to be the light of the world. God's work, work of transforming our lives into the image of His Son so that his, the light of His Son, I'm the light of the world, might shine through us and that the world around us might be able to see Christ living through us. That was God's intended purpose. And as we look at this context and we look at this passage of Scripture, I think what we need to be reminded of, God has a plan for discipleship and that plan for discipleship includes, how many of y'all, you all are here today? Every one of us. Thank you for volunteering for ministry. Because that's what God intended for us to be. You and I are the light of the world. With this passage before us, I'd like to take an opportunity, if I can, to sort of give a brief outline to the passage, the verses 14, 15, and 16, and give us a little bit of insight if we can. So points number two, three, four, and five actually have to do with a, an outline, as it were, to this passage. So I want us to grab and, and understand something that we've already stated, but I want to make sure we reemphasize it. We need to understand something about the context of the passage. When we open up the Bible, when, we, when you and I as students of the Word, as followers of Christ, open up His Word to us, we need to be asking questions. It's okay to ask God questions. Okay to open the Bible and ask the Bible question. Who, who, what, when, where, why? Ask them questions. And when we begin to ask the questions to the Word, one of the reasons, one, one of the reasons why we, one of the questions we would ask would, that would be logical, what's the need for light and he reminds us that the need for light is because the world is filled with darkness. We're the light of the world. And the reason why we have light, you know, if I were this morning to be able to take, and take this light, in this context, there's not a lot of light. But if everything went dark all of a sudden in here, all of a sudden this light would have a greater impact, right? Right? The darker it is, the greater impact light has. That's why I think when we live in this world of darkness, and God's called us in this world of darkness, even though the world is getting increasingly dark, I believe the reality is the potential for the church is greater and greater and greater than it ever has been in the past if we would simply allow Him to transform us from the inside and begin to work through us as salt and then light to the world because the world in darkness would see greatly the light within. God's called us to be light. John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles this morning, I know you're going to say this morning, John 3, 16. I, 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 Pastor, I don't need to turn there. I know that one. For God so loved the world that he... what? Gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. But few of us could quote verse 17. 
For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but rather that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already. We're condemned already because we're born in sin. But because he, is, he's, he's not delivered the, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19, and this is the judgment. What, when God stands up in heaven, looking down on the world in the first century when Jesus lived, and I believe even more so today in the 21st century, this is his judgment. This is what he looks and sees. Verse 19, and this is the judgment that the light has come in the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were... I don't know about you guys, but I had a pretty rough spot in my life. Did anybody, have, did anybody rebel, rebel, rebel? rebel? Rebel. Thank you. And, and some of y'all didn't have rebel at all. Y'all were all, always good people. I need to hang around with you guys a lot more. Y'all would be a much better influence. I, I, had, a, I had a rough spot, tough spot. And in my, in my rebellious time of life, the church was not the place that I thought about going to. I didn't pick up my Bible to read my Bible because I knew what was written there. I, the only times I ever prayed was it was something like this, Lord, I'm in a mess, get me out of this mess. And I usually made some kind of promise afterwards, if you'll get me out of this mess, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Anybody ever prayed a prayer like that? Okay, all right. Somewhere along the line, we understand what happens to us when we're living in rebellion against God. We don't usually try to look for the closest church house. And the reason why it is, is because my life and what I'm living and what I'm doing and what I'm saying, we know inherently is not godly. And therefore, we want to distance ourselves from the things that we know are godly. We live in this world of light. That's the context. There's a plan. I want to take to you this morning in letter, letter number three in your notes, there's an anticipated plan. The, the anticipated plan was not plan B or C or D. It was plan A. As a matter of fact, it's not only plan A, but it's also plan B, C, D, and E, and all the way through Z. There is no other plan. And the, that plan, God's plan for us as, and, and for this world and for the world to be able to know what, who God is in November, first Tuesday in November, will not have near the impact upon the furtherance of this, this country as it would if the church would just rise up and be the church. Amen. There's a third thing I want to make sure that we grab in this passage, and that's this. That the potential problem is I'd also identified is that we typically want to put our light somehow or another under a basket and become secret followers, as it were. Now, there's probably a lot of reasons for that, why we might do that, that uh, we might find a way because of life or because maybe we're, you know, family. You know, I don't know about you guys, but probably witnessing to family is probably the most difficult people to witness to. I've, we've had that opportunity, and I'm so grateful that we, uh, we were able to talk to our parents. Well, my mom, and my mom and my dad, I knew, but my mom before she passed, and Karen's mom and dad both before they passed, we had the opportunity to be able to talk to them specifically about faith, as awkward as those conversations were. But sometimes we push back from those things. It's hard sometimes. Sometimes we want to not be as open maybe about our faith as we, we probably ought to. But Scripture says to us, when you light a light, when you, when you light a candle, when you light a torch, you don't put a bucket over top of it, but you actually light it so that it might cast darkness away, that it might benefit the whole. And so we don't need to be secret followers. We're not masons in a secret society. We're not pagans having known the mysteries that can only be shared with those who are learned. 
We're not a cult that's only known by a few. We're a city that's set on a hill so that our lights might shine for all to see. That's the problem. Sometimes we just simply want to sort of hide. But we need to be, we need to let our lights shine. And the reason why we let our light shine, verse 16, says so this. Look at your passage. Let your light shine so, let your light so shine, so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. I want to pause right there because if we're not careful, we're going to read that and we're going to take, our, we're going to take this vehicle through which God has called us to illumine the world and we're going to say, God, you want us to shine so that they can see our good works. And to temptation is that's what happens so many times with us. We find ourselves in a position where we, 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 you know, we want to do, our, do things that are what, good and right and fitting. And we want maybe we, sometimes we just want people to recognize it, right? How many of y'all like a compliment once in a while? I do. We all, we all like that. And, and we all sometimes need those kind of things in our life. But the scripture says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. If I, I want to take a pause if I can and talk about that word good for just a moment. The typical word that we would find in Greek for the word good would be the word agathon. There's such a beauty about their goodness that becomes winsome to those who see what's happening. In other words, the beauty is not contained within the vehicle. The beauty is within the vehicle, but the beauty radiates out to draw attention to something else. And that's what happens to us. And that's what God's called us to be. So that God, God's called us that, that we might find a way to so light the world that the world might see our good works, but not take notice of us in the process, but take notice of the light, the source within. By the way, verse 16, let me take a little footnote here as well. It doesn't say, turn your light on. Are you with me? It just says, you are the light of the world. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine. If you are a follower of Christ, and if the Beatitudes are growing within you, if you are connected to the source and the transforming work is going on within you, you don't have to turn your light on for people to see the light. It's already there. It radiates without, out, without, outside of you simply because there's transformation going on on the inside. You can't, that's the reason why you can't blow it out. <laughs> you, because it's already there. You don't have to turn it on. Let me mention lastly, if I can, in this passage, there's the intended focus. Let your light so shine before men that they may give glory to your Father. Glory to God. That he might be able to be seen in your activity, realizing that what you're doing, your activity, your words that you're speaking, the actions that you're doing, the way that you demonstrate yourself are possibly and likely not normally what you would typically do, but it's because something's happening on the inside of you that ultimately brings about something radiant on the outside of you. That's why I wrote down and I shared with you earlier a statement I read off a lady's blog when I was, began the study of preparation of this several weeks ago about salt and light. And as she wrapped up her blog, and I wished I could have found it to have said it, but this is what she said. She said, I want my life to be lived in such a way that when I meet Jesus, I can honestly say to him, looking him square in the face, I can honestly say I have furthered your kingdom. Whew. 
Every one of us want to hear words, well done, good and faithful servant, right? But you know, when you stand before God, it's not like you can deceive him, right? But is it the desire of our hearts so much so that we long for the day that we can see him face to face and we long for the day where we can honestly say, Lord, I've lived my life. I've done everything. I I have furthered your kingdom. Let me mention, if I can, two or three things to you in wrapping up and closing. Most of us, if you go ahead and take the next slide, most of us today um, did not come to Christ because you heard a message from Billy Graham. That may have been the vehicle through which you came to Christ, but the reality is most of us came to Christ because we had some people in our life that were light and salt to us. The reality, who are, who are, the, who are those lights in your life? For me, it was my mom and dad. You know, most, many of us have moms and dads that were faithful to, the, to faith, and boy, my, my mom and dad were, and I was so, I'm so grateful to have grown up in a home that deeply loved the Lord and had sold their lives out by the time I knew them that that ultimately they would, uh, they would live in such a way that ultimately they represented Christ to me. My, my, my parents are the reason I came to know Jesus as my Savior. They weren't, he, my dad wasn't even the one that preached the night I came to go know Christ. There was a guest preacher that night, so it wasn't like I was, I was just following my dad. It was, but they had sown enough seeds in my life that I saw Jesus in them that it drew me to Christ. And when the time was ready, I accepted Christ. How many of you all could say there's somebody in your life that really drew you to Christ? Most of us can this morning. I, 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 I challenge you, as I've done just over the last couple of weeks, I've just, I've just paused to thank God for the lights that have been given and shown in my life. Where would I be? Obviously, where would I be without the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? But where would I be without a mom and dad who loved me enough to show Jesus to me? And we could say the same thing about the lights in your life as well. Let me say secondly, if I can, up on the screen. As a light, our influence potential is directly related to our connection with the Lord. We've already said that. If we don't have a connection with the Lord, there is no light. We don't have an opportunity, no matter what we may do, and no matter how many times we, we may click the switch, we can wave our banner, we can talk about this vehicle, we can show everybody how good and wonderful that we are. But unless we've got a connection with Christ, when we flip the switch, nothing happens. And I'm fearful so many times that the church, can I say this honestly to us today? I fear too often the church is more concerned about the showiness of who we are than we are showing the radiance of God. And I think that's what's happening with our world today. And when the world looks at the church, they're not impacted by the work, by the, by the church anymore. Why? Because we've lost the opportunity to be salt and light because we've deluded ourselves with all the things of the world. And we've become so disconnected with the source that the best we can do is wave our little banners. Lastly, I want to make sure that we don't find a way to hide the light. If we're connected as we need to be with Christ, there's no need to hide that connection. Jesus said this way, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. I don't want that to happen to you. I want to make sure that God knows who I am, and I know he will. He knows my name, and he knows your name if you know Christ your Savior. But this morning, the light is on because the batteries are connected. So today, I wonder, I wonder when I look at my life, What difference have I made for the kingdom? What difference have you made for the kingdom? If we get to the end of our life, Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. I want to say that. 
But I have become burdened over the last several weeks as I begin to study this series. I've become burdened. I want more than anything else to be able to say before God, I made a positive impact for your kingdom. Not in any kind of braggadocious way, but I, that's, my, that's what God's called us to do. That's simply our mission. So at the end of the day, I just want to do what God's called me to do. How about you? Do you want it enough to make sure that you remain connected to the source? And do you want it enough to make sure that in the scope of light, life, we don't do anything to hide the light that emits from us, rightly connected with the Savior? Would you stand with us for prayer, please? Father, we do bless you today, and we thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given to us as your children to know you as Savior, to have an opportunity that our lives might be transformed by the power of you at work in our lives. Your Spirit works within us to be able to make us more like you, less like us. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, we have been... We've been predestined to be made in the likeness of your Son. And God, I want that. I look around at our community and my goodness, we're, we're seeing rapid growth all around us. And if I understand anything that your word tells us, it tells us that our responsibility to this city is growing. It's increasing because this city is increasing. And I pray, oh God, today, thinking about that wheat field that that little baby died in because there wasn't a, a church, so to speak, a group of people that held hands and walked together to accomplish that same purpose. May it be never said of Northridge Church that we've ever, ever come to the place where we've not fulfilled our mission or not sought to fulfill. May, may it never be said that we got so distracted with life and stuff around us and things that were happening around us that we ever got to a place where we ever let go. Because, Lord, I don't want a child to die. Because we as a church was not together doing what you've called us to do. God, call us to yourself. Raise us up. Call us out, oh God, out of our pits and raise us up to be the men and women, boys and girls you've called us to be so that in this world of corruption, we may leave a taste in the mouths of those we meet that is, that is winsome and attractive, that ultimately builds thirst for the things that's within and may we radiate the love of the Lord Jesus in such a way that the world will see Christ in us and that ultimately they may glorify our Heavenly Father that you've called us to direct people to God use us we pray in Jesus name Amen mm -hmm.